welcome everyone. I am super, super excited with our panel today. And I am delighted to welcome Mr. Archin Steiner, head of the UN Development Program, who is fighting for young people and for the protection of our common home. Mr. Archin, I know you've been to so many COPs and that you super understand what more COP delegating are passing through. So I am really willing that we have a nice conversation today and that we are all able to hear your thoughts on our panel. So with no further more, let's meet these incredible youth delegates. Can you guys present yourselves in one minute, saying your name, um, age, location, role in MOCOP, and why are you fighting for climate action? Thank you. So let's start with Gladys. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And hello, um, UNDP administrator. So um, pleased to be here. My name is Gladys Habu. I am 25 years old, and I am in Honiara, Solomon Islands. I am part of MOCOP. 26 is one of the event organizers representing Oceania. Um, and I started doing climate activism um, because of the loss of our island, Kale. Um, so it used to be home to not only my grandparents, uh, but we also had the opportunity to enjoy the abundant life that Kale had to offer. Um, but as of 2014, Kale has completely submerged and this has personally affected us in many ways. And that's why I keep fighting. Thank you. Hi, Thank Gladys. you. Very nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So, Livia, please go ahead. Oi, <laughs> uh, primeiramente. Hello, everybody. My name is Livia, and I'm 18. I live in Brazil, São Paulo, São Paulo, Brazil. I work as a staff member and event coordinator in Mall Club 26, representing the Americas. Uh, I work with the volunteers and the delegates and with the translation team in making like the whole thing viable for everyone. And uh, I went for the climate activist because like I went uh, year, last year to the Stockholm Junior Water Prize and I just noticed that people just don't have like the same education now around the world and it needs to be democratic as the same way people do not feel climate crisis the same and it it is doing us to lead it in different ways and to not be together and leading them. So I basically fight for democracy and human rights while we have like the climate crisis. Thank you, Olivia. Um, Vikram, can you go ahead? Yeah, sure. So Namaste. Hi, everyone. My name is Vikram Srivastav. I'm 25 years old and I'm from India. I represent India as to delegate in mock COP. So my class activity started uh, after I graduated my master's. And after that, I have started traveling within India. So what I came to know that India is struggling more than just climate change. It is struggling in climate change, malnutrition, inequality, poverty, and other ecological degradation also. So I started writing and researching more about that and connecting to youth and other stuffs around going. So I'm passionate about improving life quality, which involved a wide range of ecosystem management activities to increase resilience and reduce the vulnerability of people and environment to climate change, to rethink the surface of cities, all about how we can adapt the challenges of climate change and nature instead of against nature and ecosystem-based approach where environment should be the foundation of economic and social success. Thank you. Thank you, um, Kevin. Okay, yeah, my name is Kevin Mtai from Kenya and I'm 24 years old. And uh, I am the, I was the event coordinator and also the staff at MOCO 26. And I was dealing with partnership and also I was the one who was operating social media, especially Twitter. So I became uh, in this field of climate activist uh, after my experience when I was uh, as a, when I, I remember the story when I was still a child, we were living in a big slum 
here in Kenya called Kibera. Yeah, that's the way, through that story, the way I saw people, uh, small children were suffering because of poor sanitation and also water not clean in that area. So that is the, during when I was in a medical school, that is the way I started to, to, do, to become a climate activist and an environmental defender, yeah. Nice to meet you, Kevin. And you may know or not know that um, you know Nairobi was my home for 10 years and um, I still miss it very much here in New York. So um, it's nice to have a Kenyan with us as well. Good to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Mahikla, you please. <laughs> Yeah, hello, and thank you so much, um, everyone, for everyone for joining today. My name is Marie Claire. I am based in Switzerland, and I was supporting mock-up beforehand, and then I joined as a delegate for Switzerland. So I was representing Switzerland with my other friends in the with some friends um, in in the mock-up, and I'm also very very glad to be here. And I am fighting because there is no other way. And I have been seeing as a small child already how our glaciers are melting. This um this is very crucial for 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 I mean everything water security, food security, and it's also a loss of identity. And it made me so sad, and I got really depressed um before I realized that only by starting and acting myself I can make a difference and. Yeah, that's how I ended up here, and I'm so glad that I met so many wonderful people, and some of them are here in this call. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your presentations. And now I invite Mahi Klesh to make her presentation on the outcomes of MOCOP. So please go ahead, Mahi Klesh. Yeah, as already mentioned, I mean, many people who have been very involved in, in MOCOP, also in the staff, are here. So if I miss something, please to um, add your view because as mentioned, there are so many people who have been putting this together and so many stories behind mock-up. But mock-up happened throughout the last two weeks. And today actually we had the closing um, remarks over lunchtime, um, London time. So what was this mock-up and what happened? Um, because earlier this year it was announced due to the pandemic that the COP26, which should have happened in Glasgow is going to be postponed. Many young activists really feared, including myself, that this will also result in a lack of action. And I mean, we can actually see this because, for example, the National Determined Contribution, the NDCs, very little have been handed in. And I know that UNDP is also working on this. But actually, yeah, many young people were very frustrated and we thought that we really have to come up with something um, and do something ourselves because we no longer want to wait until someone else is doing it. So young people came together um, to, to first like really Think, okay, what can we actually do um, in, the, in the midst of this pandemic? And then um, we decided to run a mock COP26 um, for two weeks as the actual COP. We had to shift a little bit the date um, and also very important for us to focus on topics which are normally maybe not um, addressed adequately and topics which are very important for us as young people. And you can actually see the five topics um, here. The first one, climate education, a topic where many young people still feel that we unfortunately didn't get the education which is needed to treat this crisis as a crisis. Then also the second one, which is I think very close to everyone who is here today on this call about climate justice, um, a topic which is unfortunately still um, treated also at the international conferences. Then the next one also very important, we already heard it in the, in the opening statements, climate resilient livelihoods. And the next one actually I think is something we completely miss in the negotiations it's about physical and mental health especially the second point about mental health. Many young people share a common story of being depressed, feeling sad, um, and this is absolutely not addressed. And I'm very glad also that now um, the, the anxiety of the climate crisis is, um, can be treated as a, as a mental health issue. So it's recognized. Um, and we had also one of the focus um, on, on the health aspect, which I think is very important, especially also to address now in this current crisis. And the last one was about the NDCs, um, because this um, is the legal instrument we're having and we are seeing a lack of um, ambition, as it was said, and also of the involvement of young people. I mean, we have some champions uh, who have been involving young people, but unfortunately, uh, not all countries included young people. And on a side note, because we were running this completely online and there was no flight involved, we of course could of course um, reduce significantly the amount of CO2 emissions while actually making it very, very inclusive because there was a focus 
on glo Global South young people and a focus also on Indigenous peoples who normally cannot even make it to the COP. And we can actually see this here on this slide. Um, we had more than 330 individuals coming from 142 countries. And we can really be proud of this to have this um, yeah, this global and uh, uh, this global uh, mock-up happening, and we also had translation of different languages so that everyone is um, can express him or herself in the language um, he or she feels most comfortable about. So this is really a big success, and many young people have been joining for the first time in their life such a conference, which I think is is an amazing achievement per se. Um, the delegates came from all over the world, as you have been seeing, and they have been producing, also myself, we have producing together with the other delegates, a high level statement, talking what we would do if we would actually be the negotiator, for example, for Switzerland, or from Brazil, or from India, or from all the other countries. So we have been coming together to produce this high level statements, and then throughout the, throughout the weeks, we have been working on the different five topics you have been seeing before, as well as we had some other inspirational talks, because everyone is here to learn, to share. And so it was filled um, throughout all different times that we can accommodate to different time zones. Um, it was a learning and working journey, and all of it concluded actually in this COP uh, treaty and in the declaration we are also going to show you in a second. Also, because one of the goals was actually to be very broad, um, we had a huge impact also through our coverage um, in the classical media, through um, newspaper, to TVs, radio shows, but also, of course, social media to reach many young people. You see some numbers here, so it was incredible how many people we could reach. And it's very important also to really mainstream it, because as we mentioned, one of our topics was climate education. Education can be done through media. So this was one of the focus, and we're really happy that the stories got shared so publicly all over the world. I have been mentioning, we have been working about the COP treaty. Um, we can also hand over, you already got um, one of the copies, which was concluded around the five topics we have been working on, as well as all the high level statements. And now we're working also to follow up on these with the dedicated countries. And this is not the end. Um, we want to be engaged. We are going to be engaged. There are other youth conferences coming up. We are working on linking them. There is the global um, COI conference of youth uh, in 16 happening in combination with the COP26 in Glasgow um, through the Yango uh, youth constituency. There is a virtual COI uh, happening in March because again, we probably can't not, we cannot meet. There are local conferences going on. So I think young people really demonstrated that we can work on a global scale together, that we can collaborate. And yeah, here also, uh, if you want to follow us or if you want to stay um, in touch, uh, this is how yeah, people can reach out to us. So this was a little presentation, but if someone has to add something, please do add your inputs. Thank you so much, Marie Claire, for the presentation. Does anyone have something to add? No? OK. So let's go ahead. Mr. Aching, do you have any questions or thoughts for the delegates on everything you just heard? Well, my first comment is simply to say how amazing I find it that you have been in the midst of this pandemic, been able to organize this mock cop. I think it's um, and not just logistically is it a major feat, but um, the fact that so many of you could come together. I mean, Gladys from the Solomons, um, Paloma from Brazil, Lydia, Vikrant, Kevin. I mean, you guys are extraordinary in managing to do something that you know so many are struggling right now, which is to not become paralyzed by by this um, terrible virus that has hit us and um, i um, i simply um, you know want to say to you i draw an enormous amount of energy out of the fact that it is people like you who actually keep going right now and my question to you really is um how did you find uh, organizing a mock cop because in one sense you have embraced the fact that this is an intergovernmental instrument where you know, sovereign nations come together and, and try to find common cause in the face of a problem that hardly anyone is denying anymore. But how is it when you suddenly were delegates and you had to represent, you know, the Solomon Islands versus maybe Switzerland or the United States or Brazil or Germany? And did you find yourself um, having to suddenly look at differences and different interests, or was it still 
quite clear that there is a common purpose. Does someone wants to pop in and, and answer? Like ladies, <laughs> my <Michael. laughs> I'm happy to go on. I'm happy to go on first. Um, thank you so much for your, for your question. Um, I think many of us um, would agree that it has been really challenging um, all throughout Smart Cop, but also very um, successful and rewarding in a sense as well. Um, coming from the Solomon Islands and you know having my full-time job still going on at the same time, um, I was still able to stay up at night, um, you know, somewhere in the middle of the morning uh, to come on because this is a very important um, issue that we need to be addressing. And um, I, can't, I can't go to sleep at night knowing that there's still a lot to be done. And, and that is what, what sort of keeps, keeps me going here. And I'm sure a lot of the others will also feel the same as well. And so I think um, being able to represent Solomon Islands means a lot. And our people are very grateful that Mokop 26 has given us the opportunity to amplify our work with them. Because we do not often have this opportunity um, in the actual COP or um, other major world events. So it definitely is um, a great exposure for our country. And we really hope that the personal stories that we share um, um, is something that sort of uh, helps to get people that are still denying um, climate change to realize the reality that we are facing and emphasize and also help us engage the to quickly address this issue as much as possible. Thank you, Gladys. Thank you, Gladys. Thank Does you. anyone else want to answer? If not, <laughs> let's go ahead and start the discussions. Um, as I know, Mr. Archin was also a professor. As I said, I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say on everything. And Everyone, please remember if you have something that you want to say, just raise your hands and I will um, pass over to you the mic. So let's start on with the, the questions. Um, can you start, Livia? <laughs> sure. And just let me take my documents because like I just wrote something. Okay, so I have a, a question about like climate diplomacy. So how, from now, will climate diplomacy dictate the rules of the interna international scene? So on that subject, um, what do you see as the changing role of Brazil and other large global South nations in climate diplomacy moving forward? Mm -hmm. Well, I think first of all, nations such as Brazil, whether it's emerging economies, developing economies, always have to find a balance in their own engagement in an international discussion between the national pressures to eradicate poverty, to develop um, economies, create jobs and livelihoods, and the necessity to recognize that on something like climate change, there is no national boundary. You have to work with others, you have to collaborate with others. And I think what sometimes in, in past years has been difficult in our climate negotiations is that we live in a very unequal world. So while everybody recognizes that we actually have a common problem and there is no solution, whether it's the Solomon Islands or the United States, just to juxtaposition two you know, countries that are by size, totally different by emissions, historical or current, totally different. Mm -hmm. Yet what happens to you, Gladys, to your family, to your country, your community, is in part linked to what Americans decide to do or indeed Brazilians decide to do. And this is part of the difficulty of these climate negotiations that we come with very different um, histories with a great deal of inequality. You know, people argue historical emissions should determine what you do faster now. Um, no, it is the fastest growing economies that should act all of this has really held us back. At the end of the day, I think every leader, every country, whether you're the Solomon Islands, Brazil, the United States, the UK, China, India, um, the climate challenge is first of all, a challenge to our own survival. So every government needs to act and needs to be very progressive in acting. And you know, the responsibility and the opportunity to act is first of all, 
defined within nation states. We elect our leaders. Our leaders are meant to provide us with leadership and to make sure that we have a future. Now, the fact that there are others who have to join this action does not give an excuse for not acting within one's own country. But it is the increasing levels of deforestation in Brazil, but also the success story of Brazil in actually reducing deforestation and the forest fires in the last decade. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Very, very important contribution. Brazil was one of the countries that was having the biggest deviation from a so-called business as usual scenario because it acted. Um, India has invested in you know, renewable energy now in the last three to four years in ways that 10 years ago, nobody would have really advocated for because it was viewed as an expensive technology. Others should take responsibility. Why should India do it? And yet now India is at the forefront of promoting renewables, China with its announcement to go towards net zero. So my point I think is that there is a national responsibility and a national opportunity to act. And every government owes to its own citizens to do the maximum possible to take our economies into a low carbon future, because that is the future of our global economy of our nations. And it is so because it is a necessity. At the same time, we have to find fair ways of cooperating with one another, because if we cannot get all countries to move together, you have the free ride, it will undermine our efforts. And I think this is where the United Nations Convention has been so important. It's not a magic wand, as you all know. I mean, it's been very frustrating. It's been very slow. But you know, the power of bringing all the countries every year together in this spotlight that the world then watches how countries are either acting or not acting ultimately has been a very powerful driver also for national climate action. And um, I think it was Paloma who mentioned the NDCs also, or one of you just now. You know, the NDCs are a document, they are a technocratic, um, you know, expression in the convention, but actually what they really are, they're national climate strategies. And that's why I and why we in UNDP have put so much energy in helping countries to work on their national climate strategies, because these are national expressions of sovereignty. It's what we will do as country A or country B and this is what we bring to the table of our collective international action. It's too slow, too many excuses, too many loopholes, too many different ways of measuring. These are all weaknesses. But remember, we're trying to get 7 billion people to dance together in one group. And um, this is really, really tough. But what I would like to end my comments with is, particularly from you, I take so much inspiration because you justifiably cannot tolerate excuses. You should not tolerate them. And what's so amazing about you as a generation right now is in the way that you have taken this challenge of climate change is that you have said, and we're not powerless either. Yes, you don't have the power of a prime minister. You're not the head of a you know, corporation, but you have extraordinary power when you come together and you start speaking, first of all, truth to power. And secondly, you become a movement. And you know, everything in history has taught us when people get together, when they become a movement, nothing can stop them. You know, whether it was the Berlin Wall, whether it was revolutions or whether it was innovations, whether it was fundamental rights, the right to vote for women. These things don't happen because one waits for somebody to become enlightened. It's because people start not only caring about an issue, but they come together. And in that spirit, I think, many of the countries that your question um, referred to are actually feeling that their own citizens, their own youth is um, demanding a different posture. This is not a chessboard on which we play a chess game in these you know, annual negotiations. This is about responsibility and opportunity to act and to act now. And I think that is why, again, to just say these NDCs and national climate strategies, they are a means to an end. They're not an end in themselves. But without those national climate strategies, neither the convention can work, nor can you hold your government accountable because they will never have written down what they're actually committing to do or not to do. Both are equally important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aching. Yeah, and uh, we need to sorry. <laughs> and we need to remember that NDCs are just papers when we do nothing. 
like for example, we had on we have on more COP26 treaty a lot of things that are already on the in Brazilian constitution, like the Europe for a health uh, and environmental, but we need to put it in practice. So if we don't do it, it's just words, it's just like speeches. Mm -hmm. True. I mean, I can add nothing to what you said, uh, Livia, and I would simply say uh, it's in the same logic that we hold governments accountable. And, um, you know, just in, in your part of the world, if I may use that expression, you have seen just over the last year how people have come out onto the streets. They have demanded constitutional changes. They have um, overthrown governments. They have um, voted out leaders. The power of the people is the only way in which ultimately the will of the people can, can actually make documents become reality. We can write long papers. And as you know, in the United Nations, we write a lot of papers and resolutions and reports. But I always view them as a means to an end. And if you lose sight of the end, which is action on the ground, they become often useless. So I don't disagree with you at all. Um, Kevin, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Okay, okay yeah, I'm why it's very important to include the MAPA country, uh, uh, stroke uh, Global South country, especially in, and also youth, especially in, in this policy where they have been discussing maybe policy uh, about climate change, especially in this climate forum like COP and uh, other climate forum, yeah. I agree entirely with you. And, you know, when I lived in Nairobi, which was, you know, um, in the years from 2006 to 2016, it was actually the moment when, um, you know, Africa began to develop a collective voice in the international climate policy arena. Because, you know, the continent is large. There are many individual countries, you know, just having the money and the um, the expertise to field all the experts in these different areas is difficult and the African Union played a um, remarkably important role in bringing you know the continents many voices together and I think it marked a real uh, turning point in the climate conferences because Africa could speak to the world both about the impact that climate change was having on on its people on its economies but it also was beginning to provide leadership um, in the way that, you know, many African countries today have not the challenge that some of the more industrialized countries have, that they have very heavy old technology legacy economies. And, you know, I witnessed that in, in Kenya myself. Kenya is actually one of the world's leaders uh, in renewable energy, um, whether it is geothermal power, and you know, Kevin can tell you a lot more about this than I can. Um, Kenya is a pioneer on the African continent, you know, and it provides vital, um, stable power production for the national grid. But then Kenya is also building the largest wind power farm on the African continent right now. And it did so often against the advice of traditional economic planners and uh, development institutions because it believed that its potential for renewables is very significant and it had to take a step into the future. I think it is that kind of um, story and reality check <clears throat> that is so important in these conferences of the parties because we talk about figures and carbon emissions and GDP and so on. The truth is um, in Kenya it was initially access to electricity. People in large part didn't have access to electricity. So how do you first of all connect millions of people to electricity, which is central to enabling development to progress, but at the same time not recreate a fossil fuel based electricity economy of the last century, but invest in the future. And this is so much of what we need to you know, not only persuade politicians to do, we have to convince our own citizens that actually this is a shortcut to progress. And, you know, today it's much easier than 10 years ago because today renewables often are more competitive than fossil fuel production of electricity anyway. But um, I think in that sense, we need the developing world, not only in a sense as a participant in the COPs, they need to shape the agenda of the COPs and they need to bring the reality of developing nations into that joint 
effort of how we deal with climate change. Um, it's it's central to the success of um, having a transformation pathway in the global economy. And just to give you a sense, if Africa were to say today, look, we have um, probably 2 billion people by the year 2050 on our continent. Um, that would add, because there are only six, 700 million people, um, 600 million in Africa today who have access to electricity. So just for the existing population, you would have to you know, connect another 400, 500 million, and then you would have another billion citizens. So if Africa were to simply use coal, oil and gas, we would add, you know, the consumption of, you know, China plus half of India put together again in terms of carbon emissions. That is why Africa matters so much, both as, um, you know, being at the receiving end of the impact of climate change caused historically by others, but also as a key player in shaping a 21st century uh, power economy in the way we move forward. So, um, Kevin, it starts sometimes with the village and a household that suddenly has for the first time in their lives access to electricity and it can go all the way to 2 billion people choosing a 21st century energy economy. And, and that's where, you know, also we as a development organization are constantly looking at ways in which we can help countries to move forward faster. And that is um, very, very important. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, you are talking about uh, renewable energy and so I think yesterday, yesterday I saw an article on, on one of our, new, our big newspaper here in Kenya. It was saying that uh, you know most of the Kenyan people now they are from electricity to this uh, fossil fuel, especially to solar panels. So. But the government, because Kenya Power here in Kenya is monopoly, we don't have another company. So solar panel have been giving them high competition. So currently, as I'm talking, they are now want to pass a policy where they are going maybe to stop most of the people using so solar panel. It was on the article I think yesterday, and uh, it was very bad to see that most of the people are now trying to to go into renewable energy. But our own government, Kenya, want to push people again to this electricity, not renewable energy. Yeah. I don't know the details, but in the way you describe it, it would be going back in history. And I think, you know, Kenya was very bold some years ago because it actually reduced and removed tariffs, as you say, on renewable energy technology and made it easier for people to invest in. You know, I'm still quietly, but uh, very proud of the fact that, you know, we built a new headquarters for the United Nations Environment Program where I worked before in Nairobi. And it was the first building on the African continent that was totally powered by a solar roof installation. And we did that in the middle of Kenya. And very soon afterwards, you know, shopping malls and buildings and so on followed this. And solar is part of the future of Kenya. And, um, you know, let me learn a little bit more about what might explain some of the decisions that you mentioned just now. But um, as you all know, in our countries, there are different moments in politics. And um, I think we always have to be vigilant and, and ask the question, why? Why are we doing something or why are we not doing something? Um, and um, this is part of the public debate we have. Um, in that spirit, I, I hope that where Kenya has been a pioneer and a global leader, it will continue to be so because it has shown what is possible by being bold. Thank you, Mr. Alchin. I just want to put in everybody's mind that we only have 10 minutes left. So let's be a little more concise with our interventions. So now I pass over um, for Vikram to make his questions. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> So I just want to ask the head that, do you think that time has come to reform the economic structure in order to rebuild the planet uh, system transformation for climate resilient economy in order to rethink the global and local economic model? That is a large culprit for climate crisis. Absolutely, Vikran, and I think it's, you know, in the first instance, not necessarily an ideological issue. 
um, because you know we we all have different visions and models about our societies and about you know how important is inequality or maybe it is not um, is freedom to become rich um, you know the best way to drive development what we actually have in today's world and this is the tragedy of the moment is that our economies are actually distorted in the way that they through subsidies through tax policies um, through industrial and sectoral policies encourage people to behave in what is by now an irrational way from two points of view first of all um, fossil fuel subsidies. You know, we spend still in this moment $300 billion or more a year on actually making people buy fossil fuels rather than take advantage of cleaner energy. $300 billion, that's a lot of money. And it's even worse because the International Monetary Fund estimates that the total cost of this distortion in our economy exceeds $5 trillion. That's almost half of the entire COVID response that we have seen worldwide. And you know how massive that has been. So we need to reform our economic system in multiple ways. One, we need to remove those things that actually punish people who want to do the right thing and rewards people for doing things that harm others and essentially hold us back from, from dealing with climate change. Secondly, we also have to you know, go beyond, and UNDP has a long history with human development reports and the Human Development Index, in getting beyond this crude form of measuring human progress through GDP, gross domestic product. It is such a cruel and inaccurate, um, crude, sorry, well, sometimes even cruel, but I meant crude, an inaccurate yeah. tool that it, you know, ultimately narrows the way we look at development and progress to such an extent that we make historically wrong choices. And actually in a few weeks time, in a few weeks time, yes, on the 15th of December, we will release a new human development report that for the first time in 30 years finds that in this year, human development has gone backwards. The first time in 30 years. But it also introduces a new experimental index where we try to link human development far beyond GDP in the way we measure it, with also the planet. People and planet is how we need to understand the future of human development. And that leads us to very significant different choices. And economics is a central piece of that, uh, Vikran. So yes, absolutely. And I think we are seeing in many countries now um, that kind of rethink happening. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I just... Uh was uh, reading some of your articles and interview. I find this one, hope you remember that you addressed it 11 years ago, and now we are dealing with the same situation. So addressing environmental issue in the context of conflict resolution, conflict prevention, peacekeeping, peace building becomes ever more important because we know from everything we have learned and learning every day about climate change, that one thing is for certain, the world is going to be on more stress. Therefore, the mechanism, the support infrastructure for dealing with the stress are going to be ever more important. So, yes, uh, after 11 years ago, right now we are on the same thing. But you predicted it before. Well, you're right, Vikran. In some ways, it, it, it is a frustrating reminder um, that as so often in human history, there are some who, you know, begin to describe a reality earlier than the mainstream perhaps recognizes it. Um, but if you open the time lens a little bit more, um, then, you know, we are actually seeing change happen. Uh, you know, the BBC yesterday had an article that is based on the latest, um, you know, from a scientific report that will be issued soon, that looked at the commitments that Europe, China, South Korea, um, the incoming administration, the United States have made in terms of net zero emissions by 2050. Now, you know, let's also recognize that, you know, things are changing and sometimes they take a lot longer. But on the issue of conflict and climate change, I despair sometimes because, you know, every day we in the United Nations see right before our eyes how this drama unfolds. 
And um, unfortunately, quite a number of the conflicts that are happening in the world right now are in part also linked to climate change. I mean, it's not only one thing, but when people have less water, when there are more people and there is less land per person, when rainfall patterns change, you know, we are forced to adjust the way we live. We practice our agriculture. We can end up entering into other people's zones or when the sea level rises to Gladys's home, right? And the fate of um, island nations. Um, there is displacement, there are refugees, refugees arrive in another place, there is competition, there is tension. And then when governments don't work well, when governance systems are not able to mediate and to find an equitable outcome, then people start getting aggressive and frustrated and then politics stirs, you know, and then the next thing you have extremism or civil strife or even war between nations uh, over resources. You know, dams get built in one country, countries downstream, you know, will say, how can you do this? We need the water. So conflict and climate change are inextricably linked. That's why I already in front of the Security Council argued very strongly that it's an environmental phenomenon, but it affects everything in the way we live and practice um, our daily lives. And it is also a security issue. It is a geopolitically vital issue because countries can end up in conflict with one another but what is already happening in so many places across the planet is that we are falling apart as communities locally you know conflict uh, begins to emerge and turn into um, terrible dramas and tragedies and in that sense what i said 11 years ago is even more true now and even more of a reason why we need to ensure that climate change is understood as a threat with multiple dimensions. Um, and that is why it is not just about, let's save the environment, it's about health, it's about conflicts, it's about our inability to actually cope with what climate change implies. And that's why this is a time window that we always keep on talking about. You cross that threshold, you've lost the choice. I and mean, there is no easy way back. This is the, you know, the generational moment why what you do and what you are fighting for is not just, you know, a fashionable issue. It's an existential issue. And it is my generation and your generation that will decide whether we actually have a way forward or we are locked in. Thank you, Mr. Archin. Um, unfortunately, guys, we only have time for one more question. So, yeah, we have two more. So we will have to decide between the girls. <laughs> Ask the two questions and I'll give you a very short answer in one go. Thank you, Mr. Archie. So go ahead, Ladis first and then Mahikle. You will answer short. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Paloma, and thank you, uh, Akin, for agreeing. Um, yeah, so my question is, you know, related to everything that you've, you've been mentioning about climate change, um, conflict, and, you know, islands disappearing. Um, it really scares me to think that um, in the next few decades, our geographical structure will change a lot. And so UN member states will probably decrease by the time um, some of these countries, um, you, you know, that are really emitting a lot of greenhouse gases have agreed or have come to net zero. Um, and with the very slow pace action um, right now, what is um, your advice or what hope do, do we have um, here? Uh, that you could probably um, provide for us and especially for youth that are becoming dispirited in you know fighting for climate justice thank you uh, Claire. <laughs> yeah actually my question can be answered with a yes or no um, so climate education was one of the focus areas of mock-up and also in the final declaration and while considering we are in the midst of a climate crisis, ask, um, crisis asking for an unprecedented change do you think that it's time for the UN to support making climate education a core compulsory subject to every school national curriculum? So I'll start with the last question. Yes, it is fundamental. No, the United Nations doesn't force countries, but yes, we absolutely promote it. I, I already in my time at the UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, but also with our sister agency, UNESCO, you know, that looks 
um, at education and culture and science. Um, I think by now, uh, you know, national curricula are something that every country has to, in a sense, decide for itself. But I would absolutely not hesitate that any school system that does not include the science, but it's not just the science of the impact of climate change, you know, the, the atmospheric science and so on, but the understanding of what climate change does and the areas in which we can act. I think these three shape um, the kind of educational input that we need. And in one sense, it's also amazing. I mean, you are all young people. Many of you probably didn't have climate change in your curriculum. So you taught yourself, you learned yourself and imagine how much more effective, how much sooner you could have been part of shaping answers if you had been given those tools, which is what education is all about. And to Gladys's point, I think you have to continue to be impatient, but don't get frustrated. You know, frustration is a very real and a very justifiable um, sentiment in the sense of what others are not doing, but it also paralyzes you. You actually, I think, are already, you know, the antithesis of frustration and giving up. Um, be impatient, be vocal, um, above all, you know, engage with those who actually, you know, are not deliberately trying to do the wrong thing. And you have many more allies in the world than it sometimes feels like when you watch the glacial pace of politics and climate cops. But, you know, most of us are deeply troubled by what's happening. I happen to be a UN bureaucrat, uh, you know, by definition, who, um, you know, embraces the part that the UN can play in helping the world address this issue, but with the rules within which I have to work, the rules of intergovernmentalism, of, you know, consensus building, um, sometimes of very stupid arguments being used to, you know, essentially, uh, you know, beat another country at a certain negotiation. But, you know, you have in, in the Secretary General, in my colleagues across the UN, thousands of allies who are actually routing for you and are trying to, from our different ends, make the work that you have taken, in a sense, the leadership role on now, to happen and to succeed. Um, and I think that sense of uh, not giving up, um, not get frustrated, because frustration is self-defeating. And I understand because, you know, when you look into a lot of things that go on on social networks, there is a dystopian element, a kind of resignation and frustration. And there was even a survey right now that many people don't want to have children anymore because of climate change. Um, that's not the answer. I think we need more people to believe what I believe deeply myself, that, you know, we actually can shape the future. We have choices to make. And it is through, you know, young people, older people, people outside government, in government coming together that will actually make it happen. And remember, the story of, of, of human progress is not one of, you know, uh, going uh, into dark tunnels. I mean, just in the last two, three hundred years, we have reduced extreme poverty on this planet while we have, you know, increased the world population from one billion to seven billion like never before in history. We've gotten rid of diseases. We have more literacy. We have essentially more technological possibilities than ever in human history, whether it's the digital frontier or renewable energy, it's all possible. And the biggest thing that you bring to this equation of um, inertia and, and excuses is the energy that you can bring and the inspiration that you can bring, not just to your peers, but in fact, to people such as myself. So in that sense, just the fact that you organize this mock cop is just another amazing example of it. So just keep going. And thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. For saying thank you, that. thank you. Obrigado, Mr. Ratching, and thank you everyone for having the time to participate you. in, your, in our panel. And also thank you to MOCOP and UNDP for making this conversation possible. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and my privilege, and really Paloma, you are the gentlest moderator and timekeeper I have seen in a long time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Muito obrigado. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Abraço. Thank you. 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 Thank you.